Chapter Forty Three of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Forty Three. Thou neither dost persuade me to seek wealth, for empire's sake, nor empire to affect, for glory's sake, by all thy argument. Milton. In a well-furnished private parlor of one of those first-class hotels in which New York City abounds, Philip Amory sat alone. It was evening. The window curtains were drawn, the gas lamps burning brightly, bringing out the gorgeous colors of the gaily tinted carpet and draperies, and giving a cheerful glow to the room, the comfortable appearance of which contrasted strongly with the pale countenance and desponding attitude of its solitary inmate, who, with his head bowed upon his hands, leaned upon a table in the center of the apartment. He had sat for nearly an hour in precisely the same position, without once moving or looking up. With his left hand, upon which his forehead rested, he had thrust back the wavy masses of his silvered hair, as if their light weight were too oppressive for his heated brow. And the occasional movement of his fingers, as they were slowly passed to and fro beneath the graceful curls, alone gave evidence that he had not fallen asleep. Suddenly he started up, straightened his commanding figure to its full height, and slowly commenced pacing the room. A light knock at the door arrested his measured steps. A look of nervous agitation and annoyance overspread his countenance. He again flung himself into his chair, and, in reply to the servant's announcing, a gentleman, sir, was preparing to say, I cannot be interrupted. But it was too late. The visitor had already advanced within the door, which the waiter quietly closed and retreated. The newcomer, a young man, stepped quickly and eagerly forward, but checked himself, somewhat abashed at the unexpected coldness of the reception he met from his host, who rose slowly and deliberately to meet his guest, while the cloud upon his countenance, and the frigid manner in which he touched the young man's cordially offered hand, seemed to imply that the latter's presence was unwelcome. "'Excuse me, Mr. Phillips,' said William Sullivan, for it was he who had thus unintentionally forced an entrance to the secluded man. I am afraid my visit is an intrusion. Do not speak of it, replied Mr. Amory. I beg you will be seated, and he politely handed a chair. Willie availed himself of the offered seat, no further than to lean lightly upon it with one hand, while he still remained standing. You are changed, sir, continued he, since I last saw you. Changed? Yes, I am, returned the other, absently. Your health, I fear, is not— "'My health is excellent,' said Mr. Amory, interrupting his unfinished remark. Then seeming for the first time to realize the necessity of exerting himself, in order to sustain the conversation, he added, "'It is a long time, sir, since we met. I have not yet forgotten the debt I owe you for your timely interference between me and Ali, the Arab traitor, with his rascally army of Bedouin rogues.' "'Do not name it, sir,' replied Willie. "'Our meeting was fortunate indeed, but the benefit was as mutual as the danger to which we were alike exposed.' "'I cannot think so. You seemed to have a most excellent understanding with your own party of guides and attendants, Arabs though they were. "'True. I have had some experience in eastern travel, and usually know how to manage these inflammable spirits of the desert. But at the time I joined you, I was myself entering the neighborhood of hostile tribes.' and might soon have found our party overawed, but for the advantage of having joined forces with yourself. You set but a modest value upon your conciliatory powers, my young man. To you, who are so well acquainted with the facts in the case, I can hardly claim the merit of frankness for the acknowledgment that it was only my own hot temper and stubborn will which exposed us both to the imminent danger which you were fortunately able to avert." No, no, you must not deprive me of the satisfaction of once more expressing my gratitude for your invaluable aid. You are making my visit, sir, said Willie, smiling, the very reverse of what it was intended to be. I did not come here this evening to receive, but to the best of my ability to render thanks. For what, sir? asked Mr. Amory, abruptly, almost roughly. You owe me nothing." The friends of Isabella Clinton, sir, owe you a debt of gratitude, which it will be impossible for them ever to repay. You are mistaken, Mr. Sullivan. I have done nothing which places that young lady's friends under a particle of obligation to me. Did you not save her life? Yes, but nothing was further from my intention. Willie smiled. 
It could have been no accident, I think, which led you to risk your own life to rescue a fellow passenger. It was no accident, indeed, which led to Miss Clinton's safety from destruction. I am convinced of that, but you must not thank me. It is due to another than myself that she does not now sleep in death. May I ask to whom you refer? Your words are mysterious. I refer to a dear and noble girl whom I swam to that burning wreck to save. Her veil had been agreed upon as a signal between us. That veil, carefully thrown over the head of Miss Clinton, whom I found clinging to the spot assigned to, to her whom I was seeking, deceived me, and I bore in safety to the shore the burden which I had ignorantly seized from the gaping waters, leaving my own darling, who had offered her life as a sacrifice, to— "'Oh, not to die!' exclaimed Willie. "'No, to be saved by a miracle. Go thank her for Miss Clinton's life.' I thank God, said Willie, with fervor, that the horrors of such scenes of destruction are half redeemed by heroism like that. The hitherto stern countenance of Mr. Amory softened as he listened to the young man's enthusiastic outburst of admiration at Gertrude's noble self-devotion. Who is she? Where is she? continued Willie. Ask me not, replied Mr. Amory, with a gesture of impatience. I cannot tell you if I would. I have not seen her since that ill-fated day. His manner, even more than his words, seemed to intimate an unwillingness to enter into any further explanation regarding Isabel's rescue, and Willie, perceiving it, stood for a moment silent and irresolute. Then, advancing a step nearer, he said, "'Though you so utterly disclaim, Mr. Phillips, any participation in Miss Clinton's happy escape, I feel that my errand here would be but imperfectly fulfilled if I should fail to deliver the message which I bring to one— who was at least the final means, if not the original cause, of her safety. Mr. Clinton, the young lady's father, desired me to tell you that, in saving the life of his only surviving child, the last of seven, all of whom but herself were doomed to an early life, you have prolonged his own days, and rendered him grateful to that degree which words on his part are powerless to express, but that, as long as his feeble life is spared, he shall never cease to bless your name, and pray to heaven for its choicest gifts upon you and those who dwell next your heart. There was a slight moisture in the clear, penetrating eye of Mr. Amory, but a bland and courteous smile upon his lip, as he said, in reply to Willie's words. All this from Mr. Clinton. Very gentlemanly, and equally sincere, I doubt not. But you surely do not mean to thank me wholly in his name, my young friend. Have you nothing to say for your own sake?' Willie looked surprised at the question, but replied, unhesitatingly, "'Certainly, sir, as one of a large circle of acquaintances and friends, whom Miss Clinton honors with her regard, you may rest assured that my admiration and gratitude for your disinterested exertions are unbounded, and not only on her account, but on that of every other whom you had the noble satisfaction of rescuing from a most terrific form of death and destruction.' Am I to understand, by your words, that you speak only as a friend of humanity, and that you felt no deep personal interest in any of my fellow passengers? I was unacquainted with nearly all of them. Miss Clinton was the only one whom I had known for any greater length of time than during two or three days of Saratoga intercourse, but I should certainly have felt deeply grieved at her death, since I was in the habit of meeting her familiarly in her childhood, have lately been continually in her society and am aware that her father, my respected partner, an old and invaluable friend, who is now much enfeebled in health, could hardly survive so severe a shock as the loss, under such harrowing circumstances, of an only child, whom he almost idolizes. You speak very coolly, Mr. Sullivan. Are you aware that the prevailing belief gives you credit for feeling more than a mere friendly interest in Miss Clinton? The gradual dilating of Willie's large gray eyes, as he fixed them inquiringly upon Mr. Amory. The half-scrutinizing, half-astonished expression which crept over his face, as he deliberately seated himself in the chair, which, until then, he had not occupied, were sufficient evidence of the effects of the question so unexpectedly put to him. "'Sir,' said he, "'I either misunderstood you, or the prevailing belief is a most mistaken one.' "'Then you never before heard of your own engagement?' Never, I assure you, is it possible that so idle a report has obtained an extensive circulation among Miss Clinton's friends? Sufficiently extensive for me, 
a mere spectator of Saratoga life, to hear it not only whispered from ear to ear, but openly proclaimed as a fact worthy of credit. "'I am exceedingly surprised and vexed at what you tell me,' said Willie, looking really disturbed and chagrined. "'Nonsensical and false, as such a rumor is, it will very naturally, if it should reach Miss Clinton, be a source of indignation and annoyance to her, and it is on that account, far more than my own, that I regret the circumstances which have probably given rise to it. Do you refer to considerations of delicacy on the lady's part? Or have you the modesty to believe that her pride would be wounded by having her name thus coupled with that of her father's junior partner, a young man hitherto unknown to fashionable circles? But excuse me, perhaps I am stepping on dangerous ground, and your own pride may shrink from the frankness of my speech." "'By no means, sir. You wrong me if you believe my pride to be of such a nature. But in answer to your question, I have not only reference to both the motives you name, but to many others, when I assert my opinion of the resentment Miss Clinton would probably cherish, if the foolish and unwarranted remarks you mention should chance to reach her ears. "'Mr. Sullivan,' said Mr. Amory, drawing his chair nearer to Willie's, and speaking in a tone of great interest, "'Are you sure you are not standing in your own light?' Are you aware that undue modesty, coupled with false and overstrained notions of refinement, has before now stood in the way of many a man's good fortune, and is likely to interfere largely with your own? How so, sir? You speak in riddles, and I am ignorant of your meaning. Handsome young fellows like you, continued Mr. Amory, can, I know, often command almost any amount of property for the asking, but many such chances rarely occur to one individual and the world will laugh at you, if you waste so fair an opportunity as that which you now enjoy. Opportunity for what? You surely do not mean to advise me. I do, though. I am older than you are, and I know something of the world. A fortune is not made in a day, nor is money a thing to be despised. Mr. Clinton's life is, I dare say, enfeebled and almost worn out in toiling after that wealth which will soon be the inheritance of his daughter." She is young, beautiful, and the pride of that high circle in which she moves. Both father and daughter smile upon you. You need not look disconcerted. I speak as between friends, and you know the truth of that which strangers have observed, and which I have frequently heard mentioned as beyond doubt. Why, then, do you hesitate? I trust you are not deterred from taking advantage of your position, by any romantic and chivalrous sense of inferiority on your part, or unworthiness to obtain so fair a prize." "'Mr. Phillips,' said Willie, with hesitation and evident embarrassment. "'The comments of mere casual acquaintances, such as the greater part of those with whom Miss Clinton associated in Saratoga, are not in the least to be depended upon. The peculiar relations in which I stand towards Mr. Clinton have been such as of late to draw me into constant intercourse both with himself and his daughter. He is almost entirely without relatives, has scarcely any trustworthy friend at command, and therefore appears, perhaps to the world, more favorably disposed towards me than would be found to be the case should I aspire to his daughter's hand. The lady herself, too, has so many admirers, that it would be the height of vanity in me to believe. "'Pooh, pooh!' exclaimed Mr. Phillips, springing from his chair, and as he commenced pacing the room, clapping the young man heartily upon the shoulder, "'Tell that, Sullivan, to a greater novice, a more unsophisticated individual, than I am.' It is very becoming in you to say so, but, though I hate to flatter, a few slight reminders will hardly harm a youth who has such a very low opinion in his own merits. Pray, who was the gentleman for whose society Miss Clinton was, a few nights since, so ready to forego the music of Albani, the brilliancy of the well-lighted and crowded hall, and the smiles and compliments of a whole train of adores? With whom, I say, did she, in comparison with all this, prefer a quiet moonlight walk in the garden of the United States Hotel. Willie hesitated a moment, while endeavoring to rally his recollection. Then, as if the circumstance and its consequences had just flashed upon him, he exclaimed, I remember, that then was one of the causes of suspicion. I was, on that occasion, a messenger merely, to summon Miss Isabel to the bedside of her father, by whom I had been anxiously watching for hours and who, on awakening from a long protracted and almost lethargic sleep, which had excited the alarm of the physician, inquired for his daughter with such eagerness that I did not hesitate to interrupt the pleasure of the evening, 
and call her to the post of duty which awaited her in the cottage occupied by mr clinton at the furthest extremity of the grounds to which i accompanied her by moonlight mr amory almost laughed outright cast upon willie for the first time that look of sweet benignity which though rare well became his fine countenance and exclaimed so much for watering-place gossip i believe i must forbear speaking of any further evidences of a tender interest manifested by either of you but these things apart and there is every reason to believe my dear sullivan that though the young lady's heart be still like her fortune in the united keeping of herself and her father there is nothing easier than for you to win and claim them both you are a rising young man and possess business talent indispensable i hear to the elder party if with your handsome face figure and accomplishments you cannot render yourself equally so to the younger there is no one to blame but yourself willie laughed if i had that object in view i know of no one to whom i would so soon come for encouragement as to you sir but the flattering prospect you hold out is quite wasted upon me not if you are the man i think you replied mr amory i cannot believe you will be such a fool i beg your pardon for using so strong a term as to allow yourself to be blinded to the opportunity you see held out before you of making that appearance in society and taking that stand in life to which your birth your education and your personal qualities entitle you your father was a respectable clergyman always an honorable profession you enjoyed and profited by every advantage in your youth and have done yourself such credit in india as would enable you with plenty of capital at command to take the lead in a few years among mercantile men all this indeed might not probably would not give you an opportunity to mingle freely and at once in the highest ranks of our aristocracy but a union with miss clinton would entitle you immediately to such a position as years of assiduous effort could hardly win and you would find yourself at twenty-five at the highest point in every respect to which you could possibly aspire not have you i venture to say lived for six years utterly deprived of female society without becoming proportionately susceptible to such uncommon grace and beauty as miss clinton's a man just returned from a long residence abroad is usually thought to be an easy prey to the charms of the first of his fair countrywomen into whose society he may chance to be thrown and it can scarcely then be wondered at if you are subdued by such winning attractions as are rarely to be met with in this land of beautiful women nor can it be possible that you have for six years toiled beneath an indian sun without learning to appreciate as it deserves the unlooked-for but happy and honorable termination of your toils the easily attained rest from labor whose crowning blessing will be the possession of your beautiful bride a moment's pause ensued during which mr amory sat watching the countenance of willie while he awaited his reply he was not kept long in ignorance of the effect his glowing picture had produced mr phillips said willie speaking with prompt decision and a nervous energy which proved how heartfelt were the words he uttered i have not indeed spent many of the best years of my life toiling beneath a burning sun and in a protracted exile from all that i held most dear without being sustained and encouraged by high hopes aims and aspirations but you misjudge me greatly if you believe that the ambition that has hitherto spurred me on can find its gratification in those rewards which you have so vividly presented to my imagination no sir believe me though these advantages may seem beyond the grasp of most men i aspire to something higher yet and should think my best endeavors wasted indeed if my hopes and wishes tended not to a still more glorious good and to what quarter do you look for the fulfillment of such flattering prospects asked mr amory in an ironical tone of voice not to the gay circles of fashion replied willie not yet to that moneyed aristocracy which awards to each man his position in life i do not depreciate an honorable standing in the eyes of my fellow-men i am not blind to the advantages of wealth or insensible to the claims of grace and beauty but these were not the things for which i left my home and it is not to claim them that i have now returned young as i am i have lived long enough and seen enough of trial to lay to the heart the belief that the only blessings worth striving for are something more enduring more satisfying than doubtful honors precarious wealth or fleeting smiles to what then may i ask do you look forward to a home and that not so much for myself though i have long pined for such a rest 
as for another with whom I hope to share it. A year since, and Willie's lip trembled, his voice shook with emotion as he spoke, and there were others beside that dear one whose image now entirely fills my heart, whom I had fondly hoped, and should deeply have rejoiced, to see reaping the fruits of my exertions. But we were not permitted to meet again. And now, but pardon me, sir, I did not mean to intrude upon you my private affairs. Go on, said Mr. Amory, go on. I deserve some degree of confidence, in return for the disinterested advice I have been giving you. Speak to me as to an old friend. I am much interested in what you say. It is long since I have spoken freely of myself, said Willie, but frankness is natural to me, and since you profess a desire to learn something of my aim in life, I know of no motive I have for reserve or concealment. But my position, sir, even as a child, was singular, and you must excuse me if I refer to it for a moment. I could not have been more than twelve or fourteen years of age when I began to realize the necessity which rested upon me. My widowed mother and her aged father were the only relatives, almost the only friends I knew. One was feeble, delicate, and quite unequal to active exertion. The other was old and poor, being wholly dependent upon the small salary he received for officiating as sexton of a neighboring church. You are aware, for I have mentioned it in our earlier acquaintance abroad, that in spite of these circumstances, they maintained me for several years in comfort and decency, and gave me an excellent education. At an age when kites and marbles are wont to be all engrossing, I became possessed with an earnest desire to relieve my mother and grandfather of a part of their burden of care and labor, and with this purpose in view, saw and obtained a situation in which I was well treated and well paid, and which I retained until the death of my excellent master. Then for a time I felt bitterly the want of employment, became desponding and unhappy, a state of mind which was fostered by constant association with one of so melancholy and despairing a temperament as my grandfather, who, having met with great disappointment in life, held out no encouragement to me, but was forever hinting at the probability of my utterly failing in every scheme for success and advancement. I bitterly regretted, at the time, the depressing influence of the old man's innuendos, but I have since thought they answered a good purpose, for nothing so urged me on to ever-increasing efforts as the indomitable desire to prove the mistaken nature of his gloomy predictions, and few things have given me more satisfaction than the assurances I have frequently received during the few past years that he came at last to a full conviction that my prosperity was established beyond a doubt and that one of his ill-fated family was destined to escape the trials and evils of poverty. My mother was a quiet gentlewoman, small in person, with great simplicity, and some reserve of manner. She loved me like her own soul. She taught me everything I know of goodness. There is no sacrifice I would not have made for her happiness. I would have died to save her life, but we shall never meet again in this world. And I, I am learning to be resigned." For these two, and one other, whom I shall speak of presently, I was ready to go away, and strive and suffer and be patient. The opportunity came, and I embraced it. And soon one great object of my ambition was won. I was able to earn a competency for myself and for them. In the course of time, luxuries even were within my means, and I had begun to look forward to a not very distant day, when my long-looked-for return should render our happiness perfect and complete. I little thought then that the sad tidings of my grandfather's death were on their way, and the news of my mother's slow but equally sure decline so soon to follow. It is true, however, they are both gone, and I should now be so solitary as almost to long to follow them, but for one other, whose love will bind me to earth so long as she is spared. And she, exclaimed Mr. Amory, with an eagerness which Willie, engrossed with his own thoughts, did not observe. It is a young girl, continued Willie, without family, wealth, or beauty, but with a spirit so elevated as to make her great, a heart so noble as to make her rich, a soul so pure as to make her beautiful. Mr. Amory's attitude of fixed attention, his evident waiting to hear more, emboldened Willie to speak still further. There lived in the same house which my grandfather occupied, an old man, a city lamplighter. He was poor, poorer even than we were but I will venture to say, there never was a better or a kinder-hearted person in the world. 
One evening, when engaged in his round of duty, he picked up and brought home a little ragged child, whom a cruel woman had just thrust into the street to perish with cold or die a more lingering death in the almshouse, for nothing but such devoted care as she received from my mother and Uncle True, so we always called our old friend, could have saved the feeble, half-starred creature from the consequences of long-continued exposure and ill-treatment. Through their unwearied watching and efforts she was spared, to repay in after years all, and more than all, the love bestowed upon her. She was at that time miserably thin and attenuated, sallow, and extremely plain in her appearance, besides being possessed of a violent temper, which she had never been taught to restrain, and a stubbornness of will, which undoubtedly resulted from her having long lived in opposition to all the world. All this, however, did not repel Uncle True under whose loving influence new and hitherto undeveloped virtues and capacities soon began to manifest themselves. In the atmosphere of love in which she now lived, she soon became a changed being, and when, in addition to the example and precepts taught her at home, a divine light was shed upon her life by one who, herself sitting in darkness, casts a halo forth from her own spirit to illumine those of all who are blessed with her presence. She became what she has ever since been, a being to love and trust for a lifetime. For myself, there were no bounds to the affection I soon came to cherish for the little girl, to whom I was first attracted by compassion merely. We were constantly together. We had no thoughts, no studies, no pleasures, sorrows, or interests that were not shared. I was her teacher, her protector, the partner of all her childish amusements, and she, on her part, was by turns an advising, consoling, sympathizing, and encouraging friend. In this latter character she was indispensable to me, for she had a hopeful nature, and a buoyancy of spirit which often imparted itself to me. I well remember, when my kind employer died, and I was plunged in boyish grief and despair, the confidence and energy with which she, then very young, inspired me. The relation between her and Uncle True was beautiful. Boy as I was, I could not but view with admiration the old man's devoted love for the adopted darling of his latter years, his birdie, as he always called her, and the deep and grateful affection which she bore him in return. During the first few years she was wholly dependent upon him, and seemed only a fond, affectionate child. But a time came at last when the case was reversed, and the old man, stricken with disease, became infirm and helpless. It was then that the beauty of her woman's nature shone forth triumphant. And, oh, how gently, child as she was, she guided his steps as he descended to the grave. Often have I gone to his room at midnight, fearing lest he might be in need of care, which she, in her youth and inexperience, would be unable to render. And never shall I forget the little figure, seated calmly by his bedside, at an hour when many of her years would be shrinking from fears conjured up by the night and the darkness with a lamp dimly burning on a table before her, and she herself, with his hand in hers, sweetly soothing his wakefulness by her loving words, or with her eyes bent upon her little Bible, reading to him holy lessons. But all her care could not prolong his life, and shortly before I went to India he died, blessing God for the peace imparted to him through his gentle nurse. It was my task to soothe our little Gertie's sorrows, and do what I could to comfort her, an office which, before I left the country, I was rejoiced to transfer to the willing hands of the excellent blind lady who had long befriended both her and Uncle True. Before I went away, I solemnly committed to Gertie, who had in one instance proved herself both willing and able, the care of my mother and grandfather. She promised to be faithful to the trust, and nobly was that promise kept. In spite of the unkindness and deep displeasure of Mr. Graham, the blind lady's father, upon whose bounty she had for a long time been dependent. She devoted herself heart and hand to the fulfillment of duties which in her eyes were sacred and holy. In spite of suffering, labor, watching, and privation, she voluntarily forsook ease and pleasure, and spent day and night in the patient service of friends whom she loved with a greater love than a daughter's, for it was that of a saint. With all my earnestness of purpose, I could never have done half that she did. I might have loved as much, but none but a woman's heart could have conceived and planned, none but a woman's hand could have patiently executed the deeds that Gertrude wrought. She was more than a sister to me before, 
She was my constant correspondent, my dearest friend. Now she is bound to me by ties that are not of earth nor of time. End of chapter 43